Hi, welcome to God's Stories today. My name's Chris Thompson. You guys coming? Welcome to God Stories today. I'm here in Cambridge. Um, it's a very, very intimidating place. Um, I was fortunate enough to study here for a couple of years, way, way, way back actually, so, lo so long ago that um, it frightens me to remember, <laughs> if I'm gonna be honest. But I'm here in Westcott House in Cambridge, and what a place it is. I'm in the chapel in Westcott House, which is why it sounds a little bit echoey. Hopefully our microphones are nonetheless picking us up uh, loud and clear, even though there might be a little bit of an echo. I'm here with uh, an amazing gentleman whose story I can't wait to delve into to and uh, to record for all time um, and for it to bless so many people will tupman uh, it's really really great to have you here thank you so much for willing to be interviewed thank you before we get into will's story may i encourage you to subscribe to our channel god stories today and also check us out on social media on twitter facebook and instagram as i say it's god stories today and do keep up to speed with developments we really do feel that we are now in a stage where god has said you have learned the basics um, it's now time for you, Chris, and this wonderful team uh, in God's Stories today to now develop and promote the channel. And part of our developments um, is going to be an annual conference. And the first one, hopefully, is going to be on the 9th of October 2021. So do subscribe, do sort of check us out on social media to keep up to speed with those developments. Again, Will, lovely to see you, it really is. Thank you for being willing to be interviewed today. Um, you sent me through some bullet points and I can't wait to get into them. Um, so yes, once again, thank you, bless you. Absolute pleasure, it's a pleasure to be interviewed and thank you for coming and for inviting me. Well, we normally start with a snapshot of where the person is right now and then we go back to the beginning. So, so who are you right now and where are you now in life? So I am Will Lyon Tupman. Mm -hmm. I'm training for ordained ministry in the Church of England and I'm training at Westcott House. I've just completed the first of my two years here. So you're going to have two years here, you've finished your first year and how are you finding it here? You know, you can be honest, it's just you and me. <laughs> <laughs> From one West Coast to another. Um, it's really great. I feel very happy and very firmly at home here. Um, rooted in the Anglican tradition. Um, able to see lots of my friends, um, both here and outside of Westcott, um, having a fantastic time with my placements, um, enjoying my course. I'm doing a master's course at the moment as wow. part of my training. Master's in Cambridge? Yep. Wow! <laughs> That's amazing. So there's lots of actually churchy terms there actually, and we'll delve into those in a minute, just in case people who are watching this um, aren't even Christians at the moment, that sort of stuff, but they want to hear about your story. So start at the beginning, where were you born? I like to context it so we can start there. Where were you born? I was born in Scarborough in North Yorkshire uh, oh. in 1994. And did you live there all your life? Was it that sort of like the place where you grew up? I grew up in a town quite near Scarborough uh, called Moulton. Uh, I lived there for the first 13 years of my life. Yeah. And I lived with my parents for the first four years. Um, and then my father died very suddenly oh. uh, when, I, uh, when I just turned four. And uh, so it was just me and my mother for some time. And uh, she chose to educate me at home. Uh, so it really was just my mother and I, and we lived together, we did everything together. Wow. Um, we journeyed places together. Um, and that was the first 13 years of my life. Wow, so that was a, a lot there. That was amazing. So literally, bless your heart, maybe we can go into this if you're willing. Your father died when you were four, all of a sudden and you didn't actually go back to formal school, as it were. You were homeschooled from, from that moment onwards until the age of 13. That's astonishing. Um, quite a unique experience, it would seem, and it must have bonded you to your mother, to say the least. 
We were very close indeed. Um, as one local newspaper said um, when I lived with my mother, we were virtually inseparable. Oh, um, whether it was uh, going to visit a stately home, uh, going for a drive in the countryside, or going to a local cafe for a cup of tea. Yeah. Um, we did everything together. Um, so you can imagine how much of a change it was to me when she also suddenly died when I was 13. Gosh, this, my friend, there's so much to go into here. Do you mind us focusing first on your father? Mm. What was he like? Can you remember? I mean, did your mother tell you as well? What was he like as a person? I don't remember my father very well personally. Yeah. I have a couple of isolated memories of him uh -huh. from, when I was a, from when I was a toddler, and I cherish those memories. Um, I am very lucky to know a number of people who did know my father, and they've been able to tell me a lot about what he's like. Uh -huh. And they've actually also said that I'm very much like him, really? uh, which is a very happy coincidence and lovely continuity. Um, he was a teacher. Uh, he taught classics, um, he was also a keen musician, and he also liked to transport. So many of the same hobbies that I have today. So, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but you say he died suddenly. Was it a car accident, a heart attack? Or yep, it was a heart attack. It was a heart um, attack. He had a heart attack in his sleep, um, and he'd been perfectly well as far as everyone had known just beforehand. Um, and he just very suddenly had a heart attack in his sleep uh, just before the start of the new term at, at the school. And how old was he? He was 54. Do you know why your mother, if you don't, again, this is all handled with the deepest love, my friend. Do you know why your mother decided to homeschool you? I think my mother decided to homeschool me for a number of reasons. Um, I think one of the main reasons was she felt the need to be in company. Um, that company which she'd had with my dad, mm. and because the two had been very close, mm. and, um, and she really needed that company to continue, I think just as much as I did too. Right. Um, so the obvious option for her was to decide to home educate me. Mm. I didn't really think twice about the choice. I was too young and I, I was still at the my mother knows best stage, mm. and so I went along with it. And then that continued until I was 13. That must have been the most incredible experience. Did you, did you have friends that you played with, like out in the street or the parks or, the, or even the fields where you were, who were going to regular state school, as it were, and therefore you knew that there was a difference between your school life and their school life? I had a small number of friends who were my age, right. but the majority of friends who I had were through the church or friends of my mother's or people who had been friends with my father's. So more people towards my mother's age. She was in her 40s. Okay. So as you say, at the age of 13, your mother suddenly died. Again, was, 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 it, was it a car accident? Was it a heart attack? Was, was it, you know, how did she just suddenly die, bless her heart? My mother died very suddenly on the day before her 47th birthday. Um, of an aneurysm oh. and, um, and she was awake when it happened. I'd actually just got back from church um, that morning where I'd been, I think I'd been doing one of the readings. I'd definitely been singing in the choir. That was oh. the first choir that I'd joined at the local church. Um, and I'd also been administering the chalice right. um, at, at the altar. And um, she had been well when I first got back or mm -hmm. seemed well and uh, but she was having a migraine and that was nothing unusual oh, okay um, she would frequently get migraines one to two a month right and so she said she would like a, a lie down before mm. we got the shopping and uh, i thought nothing of it i thought fine um, and then a couple of minutes later i heard a massive thud in the bedroom and uh, that was my mother and um, fallen off the bed or just collapsed she just collapsed before getting onto the bed okay um, and I remember she was in a very strange position um, and um, it looked like something from a scene from Casualty or Holby mm. City. It, mm. And I was 13, so it was mm. hard to imagine that this was actually happening in real life. Mm. Um, but a few moments later, I realized it was happening. And that's when I made the decision to call the paramedics, 999. It, as you say, I mean, you know, if, it happened, if, 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 if I'd been you, I think I would have looked upon this and said, is this really happening? I mean, is this real? You know, it's such, so shocking. So you called the paramedics, 
they came out, but bless her, it was, it was too late, or she died on the way to hospital, or it just wasn't recoverable. She was conscious for some time. Um, she was able to understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, she wasn't able to communicate very effectively okay. when that had happened. Okay. Um, a natural fact that the um, paramedics had to wait for my mother to become unconscious before she could be moved into the ambulance. Okay. But they had enough oxygen supplies and things like that to keep her alive and going. And um, she died in York Hospital about an hour later. Um, but they tried so hard and they did an amazing job and I was excellently looked after yeah. by all the medical team and the hospital's chaplain. That's wonderful to hear. And bless them all and bless the chaplain. This is going to seem like a ridiculous question, but how did you feel? I mean, there must have been just a whole wave of different emotions, all just like wrapped into one. How did you feel? How I felt changed over time quite dramatically. Oh. The initial feeling was really an absence of feelings. I didn't know what to feel. Um, so I guess ultimately shock. Yeah. Um, I remember that I'd been in the relative's waiting room and then a man in a suit had come to meet me and take me into his room. And there was another nurse there who remained with me throughout. Yeah. And he said, William, there's no easy way of saying this, but your mother's died. Uh, and then he said something along the lines of, we are preparing the body and you may see her in 15 minutes. Um, he was very matter of fact. Um, and uh, I think the first thing I thought was, oh my goodness, who's going to pay the bills? Right, uh, yeah. So, yeah. which of course now I look back on and think, what a ridiculous thing to think. But it was the first thing that 13 year old shocked me thought of. Yeah. Um, and so I did then go and see the body, and she looked completely at peace. Yeah. Um, I held her hand, uh, I prayed with her, and the last thing I said to her uh, was, see you in heaven, and then I left the, the room that she, was, that she was in. Wow. And after that, I was looked after by the same nurse who had been there since the start, yeah. and then another nurse who was ringing through my mobile phone, all the contacts, to try and find a family member to, to tell about this. Yeah. Um, so was that the original plan then, for you to go and stay with a family member? Yes, and that's what ended up happening. Um, so uh, my sister was actually away on an archaeological um, expedition or conference abroad, oh. so it wasn't easy to contact her, mm -hmm. um, although she did come back within a few days. Okay. Um, Many of the people we tried to contact, I remember, were either out or not available or... Um, so we were beginning to get a little bit worried. Mm. Um, however, my godparents, who lived just around the corner from where I used to live with my mother, they'd heard on the grapevine that the ambulances had arrived mm -hmm. and they'd actually driven to Scarborough Hospital, which mm -hmm. is the other side of Moulton, and they were already driving to York Hospital, having really? been sent there. So they just turned up all of a sudden. Um, and I then moved in with them for six months. So like from, from that night onwards, you moved in with your godparents? Yes. Yep. So in my mind, I'm thinking you, you quickly went home, grabbed some stuff, and then went straight to their home. That's right. I collected my essential things, um, things like my, clap, my laptop, um, things like um, my camera, uh, some clothes, um, and the rest all just stayed in, in the old house. I just bought what I needed. Um, and then I lived with them for six months. And how did you feel about God at this time? Because you mentioned you'd been singing in a choir, you mentioned you'd literally just come back from church and you found your mother, well, not at that particular time, you see she had a headache and she wanted to lie down. Were you angry with God? Did you question why this happened? I think for me, it was this event which was almost an awakening to my faith. It became to me the wake-up call that I needed to realise my absolute dependence on God. Right. I'd been baptised as an infant, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm still in contact with the priest who baptised me, right. and, um, uh, which, which is wonderful. Um, and I'd always been happy to go to church and sing in a choir, 
and I enjoyed the social aspect, I enjoyed the singing, being very keen on music, mm. um, and my mother had been very keen for me to get involved in the church, Fabulous. and I think my father would have been too, but obviously I was so young when he died. Yeah. Um, so I'd always appreciated and believed in the existence of God, right. but my belief and trust in God, my personal relationship with God, I feel started to grow stronger from the time I was orphaned onwards. Mm. Um, and I had been, I found myself going into church when there weren't any services on, as well as obviously when there were services and just spending time in, in peace and silence and prayer. Mm. I found myself during church services more closely following the order of service and praying with the prayers mm. and doing things that I hadn't really noticed myself doing as much before then. Mm. Um, God was quickly coming into my life in a new way in that point, I feel. So rather than becoming angry and rather than becoming sort of like almost ferociously angry um, or anything on that spectrum as it were, it was almost like the opposite occurred because you just realised that actually you don't have any like, earthly parents around to look after you and your utter dependence on your heavenly father became the thing. So did you correspondingly therefore feel his presence even more intensely? I feel that I did, absolutely. And I feel that my faith has been growing from strength to strength ever since. Really? Um, my mother and I had been inseparable when we'd lived mm. together. And that dependence was a very real and absolute dependence. Mm. Um, which one could also say was her dependence on me as well as my dependence on her. Yeah. But with how quickly that all changed, my real and absolute dependence still needed to be continued mm. and I felt God made himself available for me to continue that dependence on him. What did that feel like then? You say God made himself available, because um, I'm mindful of the viewers here who, who some of them may be going through something of a similar nature, I don't know. Um, we all at some stage will lose our parents. You say God made himself more available. What did that feel like? How did that manifest itself? What were the God moments at the time, if you can recall them? I think the first few real God moments after that presented themselves in lots of little ways and a couple of very big ways. I think the lots of little ways were the many occasions when I found myself following the order of service more closely, mm -hmm. um, praying more deeply, spending more time in the church building, identifying a, a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. um, Going through my confirmation notes again, I'd been confirmed uh, three years before my mother had died, um, but revisiting them and thinking about them in application to me. Um, and then a few more profound moments as well, I would say. Um, I had said that I was home educated mm -hmm. uh, until I was orphaned. Mm -hmm. I started school uh, shortly after that and um, it was a Roman Catholic school which I attended, mm -hmm. Ampleforth College, mm -hmm. for five years, and then a year prior to that, the preparatory school, St Martin's Ampleforth, mm -hmm. and my faith was greatly nurtured there. Mm. And this gave rise to some of the more uh, intensive God moments, if you like, um, whether it was attending the Mass, which had a very particular feel at both St Martin's and Ampleforth, or speaking with the chaplain, who was always extremely helpful, mm. um, and starting formal religious education. Um, that was one of the biggest curriculum subjects at the school. Right. Um, and there started my journey in theology. Which Can you remember to... the first day you walked into that school though? I mean, there you are, you've been homeschooled pretty much all your life. You're going through, some, it really doesn't get any bigger, you know, in terms of what you're going through, bless your heart, Will. And, and, and here you are also starting school, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an institution for the very, very first time. Can you remember literally walking through the, 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 the doors on the very first day and what it felt like? I remember the very first day I visited St. Martin's Ampleforth, um, the first time I set foot in a school in goodness knows how long. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I felt excited, nervous. Um, it was mm -hmm. a taste day that I had been to. And because I had been uh, educated at home for so long, um, it was decided that I would only attend school for a few days a week and for a few hours of those days as oh, well. Okay. So gently um, helping me to settle in. Um, and I was very warmly welcomed 
both by the staff and the students, um, which I'm very grateful for, particularly yeah. because how I hadn't been as used to socialising with people of my own age. Yeah. Um, I had a huge learning curve to do there. Um, even though I didn't really feel it mm. as such then, I now recognise that I, I certainly did. And that mm. was a curve which continued for a few years. Mm. Um, and um, it was in my first full academic year in, in schooling, so September 2008, mm. when my, the emotions about my mother drastically changed. In what way? I, it suddenly hit me emotionally as to what had happened back in March when she died. Right. And I felt, ext I would find myself getting upset at random, seemingly random times. Yeah. Sometimes a, a monthly anniversary might have done it. Sometimes it could have just been anything. It might have been uh, seeing a reference to Mother's Day or, or, or something else like that. Uh, it could have been the slightest of things mm. and I would just find myself in a flood of tears. Mm. Um, and um, they, were, they were so kind and wonderful, everyone at the school. Uh, and this continued um, into my time at Ampleforth, where I was from 2009 to 2014. Um, and I actually had counselling um, right. because of that right. while I was at Ampleforth. And I found that extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the first three years I absolutely needed it. Mm -hmm. The last two years of my counselling was more of a safety net. Okay. I'd made huge progress um, in myself and emotionally by that time. So just, you mentioned, so that we got the whole tapestry here, you mentioned that you'd gone to live with your godparents for the first six months of this time. So just going back a few years now. Um, what happened after that then? Is Amplethorpe like, like a, an orphanage, as it were? Um, where did you live? So, I lived with, I, after I'd lived with my godparents for six months, mm -hmm. uh, I then went into foster care oh. and I lived in the holiday times um, in, my, in my foster homes. And homes as in plural? Yes. I lived in one foster home for just under a couple of years. Okay. And then I changed foster homes um, in 2010. Mm. And I then lived in the second foster home uh, for the whole time until I finished foster care. Oh, okay. Um, and I would live there in the holidays. Um, I started out as a day student at Ampleforth, going to the foster home each evening and then going back to school in the morning. Gotcha. And then when I changed foster homes, I became a full-time boarder at Ampleforth. So I spent the whole term at Ampleforth. Was that a good thing? It was a big change. Yeah. I look back and I think it was a good thing. It gave, um, I think it gave um, probably the full Ampleforth experience, which you can get, of course, if you're a day student, but there are so many evening clubs and activities yeah, which happen, right. um, uh, which I probably wouldn't have been able to experience as much mm -hmm. if I had continued to be a day student. I'm very grateful to Ampleforth um, for many things, uh, but especially for making my education there possible. My father had been a teacher there, so they knew a bit about me already mm -hmm. prior to my being orphaned. And um, they were very generous in how they helped me to catch up in some academic areas. I was going to say, did the homeschooling leave you um, ahead, behind, or at the same stage as the other um, young people who were in your year group? After being homeschooled, I was ahead in terms of music mm -hmm. and in terms of art and photography and quite creative things like that. But in terms of science, mathematics, foreign languages, I, I had to start from scratch pretty much. Oh, okay. So I was, overall I was put one year behind when I started in the school system in order to help, to help me catch up. Um, and they were very generous in terms of giving me extra lessons, uh, giving me extra uh, mock exam paper practice, um, and, um, and a huge reduction in the school fees as well, which Happy I wouldn't days. have been able to afford otherwise. Thank you, Ampleforth. Yeah. I just want to say, like, what was it like at that time, though, to be Will, to be you? Because bless your heart, like, you know, your anchor, as it were, you know, had been taken away. Your dad had died, your mother died, you're living in uh, foster care, um, now you're in Ampleforth um, in a more fulsome sort of way. What did it feel to be Will in your heart at that time? I think that 
particularly during my time at Ampleforth and the immediate time before, given the extent of the changes in my life, mm. um, I could have charted each change one by one as they happened, but so much was changing, I just accepted pretty much everything. And so with that, I was trying to find out who I was. I knew essentially who I was, yeah. and essentially who I am, um, but I was still trying to find out how that was all going to play out. Mm. Um, I knew that I was a keen runner. Um, I discovered my love of running at Ampleforth. Mm -hmm. My love of art and photography continued, and I continued to embrace those at Ampleforth with the many opportunities there. Um, and I knew that as a Christian, I could feel my faith developing much more deeply than I had experienced before. Um, it was a, being a Roman Catholic school, they made me an Anglican very welcome. That About was. a quarter of the students there, I guess, are Anglican. Mm -hmm. And there's an Anglican chaplaincy as well, which has full provision and a local Anglican priest comes in and she celebrates mass there. Um, about once or twice a term. Did you ever though, at any point, I mean, you, you said that you, resultant from this, really started sort of like, realise you're utter dependence upon God. And I, I've got to be honest, if it was me, I think there would have been some dark nights of the soul moments. I think I would have been in foster care thinking, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Even in this wonderful institution of ample forth, I think I would have been there thinking, why did this happen? How did this happen? And there would have been some moments, because even now, I mean, in my life, um, and I bless your heart, I've not been through what you've been through, but there are times when I feel very vulnerable in life and I feel very unsafe in life. Did you feel anything like that? Or was it really the case that God was showing up in those moments and enabling you to feel something other than that, to, feel, you know, to continue to feel this dependence upon him and for him, his presence to be so tangible that actually, apart from the moments where you obviously, as you, know, you said, were, were, were sometimes crying at you know, random moments, as it were, like you know, when, when you know, a, a mother, something came along, nonetheless, was, was God showing up so profoundly um, that, that you, know, you, you weren't angry, you, you weren't feeling vulnerable in life, or, or was it something else? I think that it can be both of those things. I think that in some of the more profound moments, those include both profoundly joyful moments mm. when you really feel and sense the presence of God, and in some of the most profoundly distressing moments where God is most certainly there, mm. even though you cannot at the time, or might not at the time, sense that he is there. Right. I remember on my 14th birthday, um, it was the first birthday that I had been orphaned for. Yeah. That was an extremely difficult day. Um, and I would not be here if it weren't for God. And it was, I don't know how I got through that day. Somehow I did. Um, and thanks to both God and God working in others, I am still here and I'm very grateful. It, it was extremely t tough at times like that. Um, and um, I definitely needed the counselling that I received. Um, and, um, yeah. If you don't mind me asking, and I only asked this once, why do you think God allowed this to happen? I can give a partial answer to that. Okay. I trust that both God knows the answer mm. and in some ways only God knows the answer. Mm. I certainly know more the answer to that question now than I did then. Mm -hmm. I recognise that if I had still lived with my mother, me going to university at all would have been extremely unlikely. Interesting. I would have probably carried on living at home. Mm. I'd probably still be living at home with her now. I think that that's what she wanted. Mm. Um, not necessarily for me, but for her. Mm. And she was always faced with the balance of 
how to fill, filling her emotional needs yeah. and also mine, and she wanted to do both as best as possible. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that that was always very easy for her, particularly after my dad had died. Mm. She found things like that quite difficult. So here you are, you're at Ampleforth. What sounds to me like, can I just say, one of the things that's coming through is, is you seem to have the gift of grace. You know, uh, I'm sure there's been times when you've wanted to sort of like shout and scream at the world and God and so forth, but... And I don't, I don't think it's just because we're on camera now, but you, you seem to have the gift of grace. Like, you know, you're talking about the people, your foster care uh, homes, your, the institutions that have looked after you, the educational ones, um, your godparents and so forth. Everything about these people, you're saying, I'm really grateful for them, I'm really grateful for them, I'm really grateful for them. That's amazing. I mean, yes, you're right. Be grateful to them. I, I, I applaud that, but you just seem to have the gift of grace. And I just want to say that's astonishing and, and applaud you for that, you know? I, th I, don't think, I don't think I could be where you are now with the kind of generosity and grace. It's, it's, it's a gift. It's amazing. It really is. But anyway, sorry, I, I kind of digress, but in a good way. So you're at Ample Forth, and, and it is forming you, and they're blessing you in terms of your Anglican tradition. For anyone who's watching this, um, we are talking quite churchy terms here, actually, like the Roman Catholic tradition, the Anglican tradition, and so forth. Um, and maybe, Will, I'll leave it to you to sort of explain what that is. Um, but, but they are dear to people's hearts. So it's absolutely wonderful that this Roman Catholic institution was honouring, you know, Will's background, as it were, and who he is. And I want to applaud you for that. Um, but it says here that a monk in 2010 was the first person to express to you the notion of a call into ordained ministry. Talk about that, that's amazing. So at Ampleforth, um, uh, in true Roman Catholic spirit, we all went to confession uh, about twice a term, one as a boarding house uh -huh. and then one as a year group. So we would each get to go to about two confession services every term. And they would usually start the confession. The monk would, a monk would always um, uh, officiate at the service. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the monk on this particular evening um, said, are you a good Catholic? And I said, um, well, I'm Church of England, but I'd still love to have a chat and to pray, please. And, mm -hmm. and so we did, and we had a really good chat and we prayed together. And um, it lasted for about 20 or 25 minutes. Mm. And then at the end of our conversation, he said to me, you would make a good Anglican priest. And that was the first time someone had brought that up to me. The first time? The first time someone had brought that up to me. And I didn't really know what to think, apart from how, wow, that's such a wonderful but far-fetched idea. How could that possibly be? But I, I thanked him, of course. And um, did, it, did it stir anything in your heart? Did you think, oh, I wonder? It did. It yeah. definitely stirred something in my heart. That was one of the more profound God moments. Really? Um, what happened then? What happened in your heart? Tell us about that. There was a short pause, and I felt amazed, confused, delighted, um, just amazed, really. Yeah. And um, he then also very generously gave me his rosary, um, which was very special to him. Mm. He probably had several, being, being a Roman Catholic monk. Um, but he gave me a rosary uh, mm. to keep afterwards. And um, I stayed in touch with this monk um, after my time at Ampleforth. And when I told him that I started discerning my vocation to ordain ministry in the Church of England, he was absolutely delighted. Oh, fab. Um, Are we allowed to know his name? Of course. He was the late Father Francis Dobson. Late, you say? Yes. Bless he died of old age oh. um, and, and an illness, but uh, he was well loved by the whole Ampleforth community. Mm. And um, he was known for his charity work um, and uh, helping those who were less able to get an education to get education. Dude. Um, he was, what a he guy. was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'm very grateful to him. And he was thrilled when I told him five years after that first encounter. It was five years after that when I started my formal discernment process with the Church of England. So, but did you, did you go away from that, that conversation there and think, oh 
man, um, I wonder if actually something of a God moment occurred here and a seed has been planted in my heart and just maybe ordination is what I'm being called to. Therefore, I must speak to someone. Or did you just sort of like hold it in your heart and sort of, and just sort of like let it marinate for a while? I held it in my heart. My faith continues to grow from strength to strength. Well, I, so, I just want to interrupt you for a minute. I'm absolutely sorry for interrupting your flow there, but I just want to say you're, you're absolutely amazing. Your faith is going from strength to strength. It's not been destroyed by the death of your mother, nor the death of your father, as it were. It's not been destroyed by the fact that you're living in an orphanage and before that you're in foster care. Your faith is going from strength to strength. You're amazing. You truly are. Sorry, I just wanted to interrupt and just say that because you need to know it. If no one said that to you, and I hope loads of people have, but if no one has, you need to know you're amazing. That's very kind. Thank you so much. That's really, really kind. So sorry, where were we? Sorry. (laughs) You let it marinate in your heart for a while. Yep. And um, I found myself really enjoying, well, all of my studies, because still going to school was a novelty for me. Oh, right, yeah. Um, So I was really trying my best in all of my subjects and my studies, and my teachers were working just as hard to make that possible as I was. Mm. Um, And um, I started performing well in exams, and um, I got I got all the GCSEs I needed, and then started sixth form. And one of the obvious subjects for me to study was Christian theology, <laughs> along with history and music. Um, I always went along with um, the motto "Faith Seeking Understanding," yeah. as as in Saint Anselm. And um, I certainly have always felt that having my Christian faith helps me with my studies Mm -hmm. and studying helps with my Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So the two have always gone nicely together and that's given me a particular passion for Christian theology Mm. um, and became one of the reasons, I guess, why I decided to do theology at university. Mm. Which university? I went to Cambridge University for my that's undergraduate. That's amazing <laughs> to get into Cambridge University. That's just stunning. That really is. Um, my wife has told me um, her journey to get into Cambridge. I grew up on the streets of South London, as I, I've been saying all day. And, and, you know, getting into any university would have just been the most astonishing thing. So to hear people have got into Cambridge, I just think, you know, fantastic. It's just brilliant. It really is. My wife came here, which is where I met her. But her story in getting into Cambridge was not straightforward, even though she's an absolute genius, genuinely. She got the highest grades in the country when it came to her grades. But it wasn't a straightforward thing. And you're here in Cambridge. You must have pinch, your, pinch, your, pinch yourself moment. How did it feel? It felt amazing. I remember when I was being encouraged to apply to Cambridge, I thought that's completely far-fetched and you know, how, how on earth would I get the grades that I need? Um, but then after my, um, after my first year of sixth form at Ampleforth College, they said, uh, you, you've, you've got to apply. You, really? you can't not apply. And I said, OK, I'll apply. I'll see what happens. And then I can say that I've applied. To my amazement, I got the interview. Um, I thought, oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> I'll go along to the interview. Did see it feel like God was in it? Did it feel like God was opening doors and so forth? Absolutely. Fab. Absolutely. Sorry, carry on. I've interrupted. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> and um, I thought, well, this all feels way beyond me, but I am going one step at a time. I am being led by God, and whatever happens, God's will will be done. Yeah. And so I had my interviews, and I had got the offer. And then on top of that, I was invited to, audi- to um, audition for a call scholarship. So I thought, well, this is just, you know, this is, this is just huge. Well, OK, fine, I'll do that. And Again, got- did it feel like God was opening all these doors out for you and making them possible? Absolutely. <sighs> and my call, God, scholarship audition, my call scholarship audition was um, on uh, what would have been my father's birthday. Oh, bless. And I had a photograph of him on the piano when I was being auditioned. I remember it very clearly. And um, So what was the audition like then? Just tell us that. Did you have to literally, you mentioned a piano in my mind. I'm now, you're in a Cambridge location somewhere. There's a grand piano in my mind and you're almost like singing next to it with some amazing, well, say Cambridge Don sat on, you know, the, the ivories as it were, and you're literally singing like some sort of X Factor sort of like, you know, contestant and away you go. Is that it? Yep. Pretty much. That's terrifying! <laughs> <laughs> and they were very precise about the, um, about the time of the audition. And uh, I remember it was something like, uh, your audition on the letter, it said, your audition will be at 10.42 a.m. in the, in the um, West Road music. And uh, right. I thought, oh my goodness, here we go. 
and um, I think it went okay. It obviously did go okay because I got the um, I got the offer um, with the Cause scholarship, um, which gave me three very happy years in the choir throughout my time as an undergraduate at Girton College. So excuse my ignorance, and also just for anyone else who doesn't know this is So you got the offer to come to Cambridge, but then it sounded like directly after that you got this opportunity for the, the choral scholarship. And therefore, am I saying, am I right in saying that um, your fees were paid outright? Or actually, thinking about it now, was there a contribution to your fees? The choral scholarship um, did, had no bearing on my academic degree. Oh. Um, it was, uh, it gave me uh, free music lessons, oh, uh, which would have cost an arm and a leg otherwise, yeah, um, certainly with the, the standard of the singing teaching that we were given. Mm. Um, uh, and it gave, it gave me the right to use the title as, as a choral scholar. Yeah. Um, the college were very generous to me in how they gave me some money off the residential fees. Um, because of the um, because of the fact that I had been a care leaver, I had been mm. in foster care, um, and also I was in receipt of a maintenance grant, nice. and therefore entitled to the college bursary. So again, very grateful. I just want to encourage anyone here, like you know, who has got dreams and aspirations, and feel like God is. I don't know, sort of suggesting that something astonishing might be possible and you're sitting there sort of thinking, no, nah, it just can't happen. Look at real story here. This astonishing young man with this astonishing story and God is opening up these things. I mean, this side of the veil, we probably will never know. Bless why God allowed your parents to die so young and, and so forth. But nonetheless, we have seen the evidence of God already in your life here. He's opening these doors. You've got a choral scholarship. You're in Cambridge, as it were. And it just seems like God's all over that. That's just amazing. So you arrive in Cambridge. You no doubt get digs somewhere. You get some sort of combination somewhere. Um, how did it feel? I mean, was it scary? Was it exciting? Was it a whole range of things? I was extremely excited. I absolutely loved it. Okay. Um, it was a bit daunting given the scale of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I had moved into a city and was living in a city for the first time in my right. life. Yeah. Um, I still remember cycling into the city centre on a bike for the first time on a road bike. And prior to that, I'd been zipping around on country lanes on a mountain bike with huge tyres. And this is all very different all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. um, I joined lots of societies and made lots of friends, friends in the college, friends in uh, cross country. I ran for Cambridge and my college's cross country team as well. Really? Um, and I, I enjoyed making lots of friends through church or just friends I'd meet at dinner. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, there were all these opportunities, which I'm really, really thankful for, many of whom I'm still in touch with, um, which is great. And it was during my time at Girton that I served as a chapel warden. So I helped with uh, taking care of and running the college's chapel, as right. well as being in the choir. Right. And I did that with Malcolm Geit, who was the chaplain at Girton College until relatively recently. Right. Um, he's just retired. And um, he was incredibly encouraging. And there's another big God moment coming up. Tell us about it! <laughs> so, in my second year at Girton, I just started my second year, I was coming to the end of my Michaelmas term of second year. I had this uh, feeling being, uh, coming in my heart about, uh, which, which was basically saying to me, consider ordination. Really? And that's when I first got that tangible feeling of being called to ordain ministry. What did it feel like? It felt nerve wracking, it felt exciting, and it came at particular moments. But what did the, what did the feeling in your heart feel like? You say like it was tangible as well. Paul, Paul Dominiac, the um, vice principal of Westcott, has literally just sat in your chair and, and done his best, bless his heart, because it's so hard to talk about what it feels like to have a call in, you know? And we talked about how actually the calling can be to a whole multitude of things. You might, be, you might have a calling to set up a TV network or to, I don't know, build a town on top of a hill somewhere or be a missionary or, or whatever, but I, I got this intuition, I got this, this sense, this, um, this gut feeling that actually the, the sense of calling, that sort of, it, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a very common thing, even though the manifestation of that calling is obviously going to be individual and unique to the person. So what did that, that thing inside your heart that you're calling a calling feel like? 
<laughs> how to put that into words. This is a really good question. How do you put it into words? Yeah. Um, I could, de- oh, if I could describe a feeling as a, in the fullest terms possible, that would be it. Um, it was a feeling of warmth, a feeling of rightness. I think that's the best way I can describe it. A sense of something being right, like when I would go to church and see the priest celebrating mass, there was something which felt right about that and thinking, I can see myself there. Uh, I think that that would be a natural fit. I feel, more importantly, that mm -hmm. that would be a natural fit. Uh, Being nearer the altar, whether that was, uh, uh, particularly when I was serving or doing something else or administering the chalice at Holy Communion, I would be near the altar in that particularly sacred part of the church. And there was something which just felt instinctively right. Mm. Uh, perhaps this is the musician in me coming out. Um, I would sometimes feel it, especially doing some choral anthems or some hymns, uh, whether it was the music, the words, or mm. combination of the two, which awoke that sense in me further. Um, and I really felt that sense in particular at those, at those times. But then I thought, this is, this is happening more often. Right. I'm feeling this more often. And as you say, this is your second year in, in Cambridge? Yes. Right. Second year in Cambridge. So what happened? Did you go speak to someone? I did. I emailed uh, Malcolm, uh, Malcolm Geit, mm -hmm. asking him if we could have a chat about something. I thought, I can't put this into words on an email. I'll, t I'll tell him in person if I'm feeling up to it. Um, but I'll just arrange to have a chat. And so he said, yes, of course, shall we have a chat after lunch and informal Eucharist at Wolfson Court, which was then an annex of Girton College. So I said, yes, of course. And a couple of days later that happened. And he said, so William, what is it that you wanted to talk about? And I somehow managed to splutter out the words, I um, uh, um, think I might be being called to ordain ministry. And Malcolm just beamed from ear to ear, and he said, well, William, I was expecting you would say that. And he reached down and got his bag up onto the table, and he pulled this vocations magazine out. No. And he said, I bought this along for you to have a look at. And it was this uh, vocations magazine published by the Church of England, geared towards young people in particular. Right, right. And from th that was kind of terrifying, but also exciting. Yeah, yeah. He'd completely preempted what I was going to say. And um, that, from that day onwards, uh, he put me in touch with my vocations advisor, and that's when the discernment the process, process started. started. I just want to say as well, in terms of vocations, um, discerning vocations has been part of my vocation uh, for a long, 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 long time. And it's often the case that something of what Will has just described there, whereby um, it's not just the individual sensing that, that calling, that really hard to describe sense in your heart that there's a there's a something from God here it's not just that person um, who, who feels it it's often the case that those around that person will have discerned something of that calling at the same time and it's a wonderfully common thing actually because when you said like you know I've made a, an appointment to go and see Malcolm and actually you know he got something out there in a big smile I thought that's it, boom, you spotted it already. God's gone before you and prepared the way, which is just wonderful. Let that be an encouragement for you. Absolutely amazing. Sorry, I've interrupted again, I'm getting excited. I do apologize. So you started the formal process. Um, you, you went to see a diocesan director of ordinance, probably, and then you got to this thing called a bishop's advisory panel, probably, at least that's what it was called in my day, and you got through. How did that feel? It felt amazing. Um, there was quite a long time for me discerning, um, because of course in the, in the Church of England, some people spend nine months to a year in oh, the yeah, discernment yeah, process yeah, before they go to their bishop's advisory panels. Others spend a year or two years. It took me actually closer to four years. Right, um, right. I decided to do a master's after uh, finishing at Girton College. Uh -huh. Um, and that was in Biblical Studies at King's College London. And throughout that time I became involved in the chaplaincy there as well. I went along to their vocations group um, and that was also extremely helpful for my discernment process. Um, but I needed that extra time. Yeah. I felt that the scale of what I'm about to do is just so huge and I had also wanted to do a Masters and at that point I didn't know what my training would look like and I wanted to definitely 
be able to do my masters. Mm. Um, and so I did my masters at King's College London. And then I spent a year working in a church in South London, mm -hmm. St. Michael's Croydon. And I worked there for a year as a pastoral assistant. I had a fantastic time there and the priests and everyone else there continued to encourage me. We were working yeah. through the uh, selection criteria, the, the nine criteria as they were known as then, um, in terms of what the, the interviewers are looking at and discerning as they interview you at a Bishop's Advisory Panel. Mm. Um, and it was during that year that I went to my Bishop's Advisory Panel and it had gone, I knew that, I felt that it had gone well. Um, I didn't know exactly how well it had gone. I think there's only so much that the interviewers can say um, at, the, at the time. But um, I felt that it had gone well. Everyone else there, we all got on well. Um, we bonded well as a group. Mm -hmm. There were a few of us having our interviews that, that, uh, during those three days. What did you do on coming to land? Would you believe it ran out of time? What did you do when you got the news that you'd been given a thumbs up? I was absolutely delighted. When I heard that I'd been recommended to train for day ministry, I'd just finished volunteering on a shift in the chaplaincy at Croydon University Hospital. And um, my phone had been on airplane mode, so I switched it off, and then I got this email through from my diocesan director of ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy. I ran straight back into the hospital chaplaincy. <laughs> told them, came out, phoned my sister, phoned my godparents, they were delighted. Um, and just having that certainty about what was coming next yeah. was so exciting. And my place at Westcott House was confirmed. And, and I here started, you are. Uh, and then here I am. Okay, I just, want to, I just want to encourage you, if I may, if you're watching this right now, God can work miracles, even in the most dark, dark sort of like times in our lives. He really, really can. And, 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 and let this story just be the most incredible encouragement for you with reference to that. But also when it comes to vocations, he calls us all, you know, all, every single one of us is called to do something by God. And God will call us according to the gifts that he has given us as well. You know, it won't be like a square peg in a round hole. There'll be challenging moments and there will often be callings beyond our human ability because so they can be God. Um, but priesthood is certainly not the only calling. But if you want to find out who you really, really, really are, take a brave pill and just say to God, who am I really in your sight? And God, what are you really, really calling me to do and be? And it could be that you're meant to be a digital evangelist. You could be, a, you're meant to be like a businessman or a woman or a doctor or a nurse or, or, or whatever really. But as long as you're doing that in the name of Christ, that's your calling and, and go forth and, and do so with like confidence and a sense of um, commissioning to you. And that's when you come alive, it really is. Well. We've come to the present day, but we are running out of time, okay? Um, so I want to ask you some theological questions. In fact, there's two that comes to mind, okay? One that I ask all of my interviewees, but there's one that I think I want to ask you uh, in particular. Who is God to you now? So, for instance, some people, when I interview them, they profess that actually God has been, if you like, different things at different seasons. Sometimes God has been properly father, you know, when they really, really need God to be Father. Sometimes God actually has been a bit of a, well, at least they've, they've intuited God, perhaps incorrectly, as being a bit of a policeman in the sky, wanting to sort of like catch them out whenever they do something incorrectly. God has sometimes been very imminent. Sometimes God has been very distant. Um, sometimes God um, is much more about Jesus Christ incarnate here amongst us, as it were. Who is God to you right now? To me, God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is all loving, all forgiving, and always present, both when I can sense that and when at other times I might not have in the past. And what would you say to anyone watching this video now, whether they're in a good space or a bad space, whether they're watching this during the day or in the wee small hours of the morning, what would you say to them now in terms of Jesus Christ and a word of encouragement for them? Nothing is impossible, everything is possible. Realise your potential and achieve your goals. Even though some things can be impossible for people, mm -hmm. nothing is impossible for God. And if God is calling you to do something, whether it's teaching, the priesthood, nursing, being a doctor, or any, anything at all, yeah. 
God will equip you in the ways that you need and the ways that he needs you to be. Awesome. Last question, therefore. It's such a shame we've run out of time. Imagine you are present on the very first Easter day. You're in the Middle East. You're in the Easter garden. You actually are a gardener. You're in earshot and eyeshot of the exchange between Jesus and Mary. You might not be able to hear it fully, but you can see something's happened. It's, of course, as I said, it's the very first Easter day. Jesus has literally just risen from the dead. What happened to humanity on that first Easter day? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Our salvation had been confirmed, as Jesus has destroyed the power of death. So it's rubber stamped. It's, it's there, it's the authenticity of, of the whole enterprise of Jesus' uh, ministry. And his glorious triumph over death. God, that's a really profound question. I'd like to write an essay on it. <laughs> <That's>, uh... <laughs> I love it because everyone's writing some. I've asked, you know, um, um, dustmen, I've asked, national leaders i've asked them all that, that that question and there's something that's always right in it you know um it's like i think it was i better not say the name just in case i'm quoting them correctly but uh, somebody's got a national job he just said on that day new life started hmm? true humanity started it's amazing that's why i like to finish the interview with that one because it's just a rousing thing it really really is thank you for your answer well, I want to thank you so much for being so honest and digging deep. You know, you probably don't share much about what you've shared today and the kind of detail you have. I think people kind of know your story, but you've been very generous in allowing me to really prod you. Um, and, 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 and in so doing, you revealed quite a lot. And I really can't thank you enough. Know that this will be treated with the utmost care and respect. It really, really will. But my, my hope in prodding you a little, little bit is that anyone who might be going through the same sort of thing in whatever variant, we'll be able to look at your story and say, well, actually, if God's done that to Will, what can he do in my life? Even though I might be really, really in a dark place right now. So Will, your story's amazing. To finish with though, and it feels a bit wrong to go straight into this now after such a profound ending, as it were, we normally do what's called the spotlight. And it's just a series of like, you know, quick fire questions, mm -hmm. okay? And I want your, your, um, your, your, your very first answer, as it were. So it's almost like your gut reactions. Try not to think too hard, okay? And it's just a bit of fun. It's just a light one. I think I saw an American interviewer sort of do this once. And I thought, well, that's a great way to finish these interviews. So if it's okay, we'll do that. Is that all right? That sounds good. Sounds Brilliant. Good. Okay. The thing you can't live without. Tea. Tea? Love it, you so should be a figure. <laughs> if you, I mean, it's a difficult question because everyone I talk to is called to do what they're doing. But if you, if you could have any job apart from the one that obviously you're being trained for, what would it be? If you could click your fingers and there it is. Teacher. Right. Um, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? Flying, I guess. Yeah, flying. <laughs> flying is the best one if you ask me. What's your favourite cereal? Oh, Weetabix. Fabulous. What, without any sugar on it, or...? Uh, with sugar. Yeah, good man. And lots of milk. Good man. Dark chocolate or milk chocolate? Milk chocolate. Um, ketchup or brown sauce? Ketchup. Can you reverse park? Yes. You're in heaven for the very first time, and you meet Jesus face to face for the very first time. What's the first thing that you'd like to ask him? I don't know what the first thing would be that I would ask him, but I think the first thing that I would say it's thank you. Well, this has just been the most incredible interview. Thank you so much. Again, I've said it before, I'm gonna say it again. You've dug deep, you've been really, really brave and I can't thank you enough for that. And it's been a pleasure getting to know you, it really, really has. Would you mind praying us out? Well, I'd love to, thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God of all ages, we thank you for this time today, for this place, and for this opportunity which we have had to meet. We thank you for Chris, for all the many blessings he brings and for his whole ministry. We pray that your calling and your will may be done. We pray for courage, especially when people may not feel it. We pray for your love and your strength to abide in all, and above all, your peace. Amen. Oh,